Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to our next session of the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference Series. I'm Dr. Hart Beatty, uh, the chair of the Education Committee for the APDR and the Neuroradiology Fellowship Director at Boston Medical Center. Welcome to our attendees today and uh, both our speakers. A uh, couple housekeeping items as usual. The webinar is being recorded and is being hosted on the APDR YouTube channel to view on demand for free. And the uh, questions and comments will also be uh, recorded in addition to the webinar. In addition, your microphones as attendees are muted to ensure optimal quality for the participants. And if you do have questions for our presenters, uh, we ask that you use the question and answer tool through the Zoom platform, and uh, we will make every attempt to answer those questions for you. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, um, two really great guys and amazing educators um, that we have again in our series. First, we have Dr. Yuming Chang, who's an instructor of radiology uh, at Harvard uh, Medical School and um, an attending at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Chang is also the Radiology Residency Director at Beth Israel. <coughs> Excuse me, we also have Dr. Alok Bhatt, Associate Professor of Radiology at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, uh, a, 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 an educator who's received awards for uh, everything he's done at his institution. We're grateful to have him as well join us. Dr. Chang will be speaking on advanced ischemic stroke imaging, and Dr. Bhatt will be speaking on voice loss today. So. Without further ado, I would like to, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'd uh, like to have uh, Dr. Chang uh, share his screen and begin his presentation. So uh, my name is Yuman Chang. Uh, as uh, Dr. Beatty mentioned, I am the program director for diagnostic radiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And um, I'm here to uh, talk about uh, CT perfusion. Um, and I have no disclosures. I don't get paid enough for uh, anything, so. Um, our goals are uh, to provide a brief history on the use of CT perfusion uh, in acute ischemic stroke management, uh, provide a brief overview on uh, what the recent changes um, brought on by Diffuse 3 and Don for us as radiologists, uh, briefly touch on the use of collateral imaging, um, and if time allows, um, uh, problem solving using RAPID. Uh, which is now the predominant automated CT perfusion software used in many major centers um, for uh, triaging of um, uh, acute stroke management in terms of uh, mechanical thrombectomy. So uh, first thing, um, this is a uh, sort of brief overview on the uh, CT perfusion technique as it was classically done. So at the level of the basal ganglia, uh, you would choose a arterial and venous uh, region of interest for arterial inflow and outflow. Uh, you inject some uh, non-ionated uh, contrast, roughly 40 cc's or so, and then you track it and analyze uh, its first pass through the brain. Uh, typically, you would pick um, the ACA uh, or, and then for the a uh, AIOF, and then um, the uh, superior sagittal sinus typically for the um, uh, uh, venous outflow. Um, and so you acquire Cine images through some slab of brain. Uh, so on a 64 slice scanner, it's typically about four centimeters. And I'm not, I'm not gonna get into the, te uh, the technique itself because you, you can get into the weeds pretty quickly uh, with all the variations and uh, techniques um, to do this. But simplistically, you, know, you get about like, let's say one image per second over 60 to 90 seconds. Um, and then you post-process the data to generate color maps. Uh, and the technique is going to be entirely vendor dependent. And what you get from one vendor will be different from another vendor because of the um, algorithms that you would use. Um, and so the data you get from it is uh, traditionally broken up into uh, what is called uh, cerebral blood volume, uh, which is volume of blood per 100 grams of brain tissue. Uh, cerebral blood flow, the amount of blood passing through uh, per minute uh, per 100 grams of brain tissue, and then mean transit time, the average time in seconds that blood spends in a predetermined volume of circulation. And this is the basic uh, formula, MTT equals CBV divided by CBF. Okay. And so traditionally, um, you would sort of do this by visual inspection. Uh, and so the infarct core, what's infarcted, no tissue to be rescued, uh, is usually um, a decreased region of CBF, uh, usually less than 40%. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, the ischemic penumbra, the tissue that is salvageable, is the mismatch between the CVV that we see and the MTT, which is increased. So for ischemic core, you have increased MTT matched by a decrease in CVV. But for the penumbra, the salvageable tissue, you have this region of increased MTT that is mismatched. You have normal to maybe even increased CVV. Um, and that's the area that uh, is potentially salvageable. So, as I said, uh, CTP was traditionally assessed by visual inspection, but the problem with that is, of course, it's uh, subjective to um, you know, variance and error. Uh, some people try to use more um, sort of quantitative data uh, to, to get a better sense of what is truly infarct. And so there are papers out there that says CBF, you know, less than 25 mils per 100 gram uh, per minute, uh, CBV less than two mils per 100 grams are thresholds. But there was really a lot of limited data. I mean, there was really limited data on how CTP could be used to predict outcomes with intervention. For example, how big um, did the uh, ischemic penumbra have to be before you had a good outcome? Um, was there an ultimate size of, uh, of the infar core that was not amenable to outcome? Uh, good outcomes. And, you know, uh, as a counterpoint, you know, for years, people were using non-contrast, uh, uh, so non-contrast head CT aspects uh, to sort of help predict um, outcome of the intervention. And we knew um, that anything less than six usually resulted in poor outcomes following mechanical thrombectomy or intra-arterial interventions. Um, but, Choosing who can benefit from mechanical thrombectomy has become really important in the last five years. And uh, the reason for this is that, you know, we have pooled data from five trials, uh, Hermes, um, which, you know, encapsulated things like Mr. Clean, Escape, Swift Prime, Extend, uh, which concluded that if the patient, uh, if a patient should get mechanical thrombectomy with a stent retriever, uh, typically, um, if the uh, patient presents within six hours of onset, he had a pre-stroke uh, modified Rankine scale of zero to one. The occlusion is a large vessel occlusion in the anterior circulation, ICA, M1, that sort of thing, greater than 18 years of age. Uh, NIH uh, stroke scale of uh, greater than uh, six. But the important thing is this, aspect score greater than six. So in other words, if the infarct isn't too big, you would have a uh, much better outcome. And in fact, you would have poor outcomes if the infarct is too big. Um, then using MRI-based techniques, diffuse one and two, uh, and this time uh, these, particularly diffuse two, used a uh, automated program called Rapid, um, and which basically established uh, a penumbral pattern, um, what they, they think would be a good predictor of good outcomes uh, following uh, revascularization. And on the MRI, what you, they found on diffuse two was that if your infarct size is less than 70, your ischemic tissue um, infarct core ratio is greater than 1.8. So in other words, you had a decent size of uh, ischemic penumbra. And the absolute difference of the uh, ischemic tissue um, to the infarct core is greater than 15 mils. You would have uh, a much better outcome. So this is called the penumbral pattern. And subgroup analysis using CTP data of the ESCAPE trial demonstrated poor outcomes in patients without this so-called penumbral pattern. So in, 19, in 2018, um, there are two important trials came out, Diffuse 3 and Don, uh, which you know, used perfusion data from both MRI and CT, um, and they both used uh, the RAPID uh, program. And um, the, the results of these trials supports mechanical thrombectomy in selected patients, ranging from six to 24 hours after onset of symptoms. You, you, we've now extended mechanical thrombectomy all the way up to 24 hours, which is huge. Um, but it has to be a select group of patients. So Diffuse 3 um, had a, a range of 6 to 16 hours, and the infarct size had to be less than 70 mils. The ischemic tissue uh, infarct core ratio is greater than 1.8, and the absolute mismatch of the ischemic tissue and infarct core was greater than 15. Don showed, uh, going up to 24 hours, that if you had uh, varying um, infarct volumes by age and NIH stroke scale, uh, that you would have uh, good outcomes. 
Um, so like I said, both Diffuse 3 and Dawn use this rapid AI profusion software, which is now the, the kind of uh, the, the standard that's being used by a lot of uh, major uh, uh, institutions now. And, but rapid does something a little bit different than what I just described um, in the traditional way of using CTP when we did it by visual inspection. So what rapid did was, um, you know, they used a relative CVF, relative to a blood flow to assess for infarct core. And so basically what it says that if your CVF um, in the affected side is less than 30% of the contralateral normal side, that correlates pretty well with infarct core. And this is an automated system. Um, the the uh, computer itself, once you send out the data, will actually automatically pick out the IF uh, and the VOF. Okay. Um, but there are some caveats to this. Their own papers, um, their own uh, trial papers suggest that uh, less than 38% uh, CVF is actually better uh, in terms of sensitivity for picking infarct core. Um, at that, their paper used a benchmark set of 50 mils, um, but it's much less specific. And in fact, um, using their own data um, with uh, CTP, it's only 55% sensitive for uh, infarct core uh, set at 50 mils but it's really specific. So you have to understand that when you're using this program, you may very well see cases where um, your aspect score doesn't match what the CVF is telling you in terms of um, uh, what, what you think would be an infarct core. So you have to be very careful about this. Okay, so um, how do you use this program in this case? Uh, well, the program will automatically generate something, um, a, a map that will tell you um, what the CBF is um, in you know, less than 30, 30 uh, 34%, 38%, and it'll give you this number. And so it's the equivalent of infarct core. It's not the same, obviously. And then uh, it'll tell you the mismatch, and this is your T max, and it'll give you a mismatch volume, which is pretty large. And because our CVF is less than 30, there's really no ratio. So this person would be an absolutely uh, great candidate, assuming that this, uh, he had a um, large vessel occlusion for uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Um, here's a, another case where you can actually kind of see where uh, the uh, program is actually picking up some uh, decreased CVF, but not less than 30, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, sort of calculate it out. But in reality, um, your uh, MRI actually shows you that there is a uh, infarct there. And so this is one of those cases where um, it's, it's more sensitive if you had used the CVF of 34 or 38%, um, which is confirmed here by our diffusion, but um, less sensitive here. But if you, the, the reason why the trials, uh, particularly Diffuse 3, use a CBF less than 30 is that you wanted to treat as many patients as possible. And so they purposefully actually picked this to kind of underestimate the size of the core sometimes. Okay, so it's becoming a lot more, um, there's a lot more uh, data now uh, suggesting that not just infarct uh, size and the penumbra is important in determining outcomes. Um, and, you know, the Fuse 3 and Don, um, you know, they included all these patients that showed some improvement, but many patients remained uh, functionally impaired despite uh, successful revascularization. And so there's a lot of interest now in looking at other factors that may uh, contribute. And one of them is collateralization. How good are your collateral vessels? Um, and how that might uh, impact uh, revascularization outcomes. And so Mr. Clean, uh, one of the trials that uh, you know, was done before Diffuse 3 and Dawn, suggested that patients with poor collateral flow did not benefit well from mechanical thrombectomy. And in fact, one of the previous trials used in Hermes, um, ESCAPE, uh, used multiphasic CTA to, uh, to actually purposely select patients with good to moderate collaterals because there was good data showing that if you had poor collaterals, it didn't really matter if you revascularized. Um, now, the two most common techniques are single phase CTA collateral scores and multiphasic CTA collateral scores. And so here's an example of a, um, a single phase uh, collateral. And so you just give you a score of zero to four, uh, depending on how much 
um, you know, how many vessels did you see? And obviously the, uh, the higher the score, the better your collaterals are. The problem with this is that it's limited because it's only one phase. And as we all know, anything involving contrast is highly technically dependent, depending on when you acquire the data, how much you inject, the size of the patients. And so um, it's been argued that uh, the single uh, collateral score has been, uh, is limited by lack of dynamic uh, information. Um, so then other people have used multiphasic techniques, uh, which allows for time resolved information. And so uh, you'll get a arterial phase, like a venous phase and some sort of washout phase. And uh, you can use uh, the, the sort of data and the combination of all three to come up with a collateral score, um, which is supposed to be uh, better than the uh, single phase, arguably. Now, what does RAPID do? RAPID actually uh, does two different things. Um, and it, instead of visual inspection, which obviously has a subjective error involved in it. What it's going to do is actually take the perfusion data and generate um, two scores. One is called the hypoperfusion index ratio, HIR. And that score takes the Tmax of greater than 10 seconds divided by Tmax greater than six seconds. So the lower the score, the better your collateralization is. And in fact, anything less than 0.4 is considered good collaterals. You have worse outcomes uh, using a subset analysis um, that the Rapid group did uh, using Swift Prime um, resulted in worse outcomes. In addition, uh, if you take the, what they call the CBV index, which means this mean CBV in a region of Tmax greater than six, and in their trials, anything uh, that was uh, lower than 0.77, uh, predicted poor uh, outcomes and poor collaterals. And so now uh, with this program, you can actually kind of estimate what you think the collateral score is without actually having to manually inspect the CTA. Okay. Um, so moving on because we have time. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, RAPID does have some problems. And, uh, you know, and you have to know uh, what you're looking at and you, know how, you have to know how to problem solve. And so uh, one of the things here is, uh, so here's a, a patient with left arm weakness, and you can see that the um, CBF is less than 30, uh, great. Uh, but here we're seeing some increased uh, Tmax in this region, right? This is an area that is considered ischemic. However, if you look at the CT non-contrast, this area is actually uh, in a region of encephalomatia. And so typically RAPID is supposed to automatically take the Hounsfield units of this region from the non-con and automatically say that anything that's decreased there should be excluded from your analysis because it's clearly uh, water, encephalopathic, uh, sorry, uh, you know, encephalomasia, and so therefore it shouldn't be uh, used. However, the, the program will fail. And this is a very good example of that. This region of increased uh, Tmax corresponds to a region where there's no brain at all. And very often, you'll see areas of increased, uh, sorry, decreased CBF corresponding to a region of uh, encephalomalacia. And so um, as a resident, no matter what happens, no matter what, how fancy the program is, the first thing you have to look at is your standard non-con head CT. That is your, uh, that's the first thing you look at before you look at anything else. Um, the other thing you have to worry about is um, sometimes, because CBF uh, is, a, is a, just a point in time, right? It's actually a, a surrogate for the estimation of infarct size. So in other words, if you had an area that was infarcted and you had a large vessel occlusion, but by the time you got the patient into the scanner and that vessel kind of recanalized, then your CBF will be near normal. Um, so again, you have to make sure that you're looking at the non-contrast head CT because if that's an area that is infarcted, but you, uh, your uh, rapid doesn't show you an infarct, chances are um, there's some other technical factors that's gone into it um, that you know, gave you the false result. Now, when the rapid CPT doesn't make any sense, then that's time to recommend, uh, it's time to recommend an MRI unless um, it's clearly 
uh, a large vessel occlusion with uh, a very high aspect score and we send the patient off to uh, mechanical thrombectomy anyway. The other thing you have to make sure is that the um, program has placed the uh, arterial inflow and the uh, venous outflow region of interest correctly. I've seen the program put the arterial outflow onto a spot of the orbital bone. Um, you know, I've seen it do the same thing in the, the parietal calvarium, uh, the occipital calvarium with the uh, uh, VOF. And this is one of those times, if you see that, then you would actually have to go in and manually change it. Okay. And lastly, um, you have to make sure that the patient uh, is, move, uh, is not moving and uh, the data is usable. So uh, for example, uh, so RAPID will actually tell you um, or give you the X, Y, uh, Z axis, and it will tell you that if the patient is uh, holding steady or moving quite a bit. And you can see that this patient actually kind of moves quite a bit in some areas. And um, you do have the power to manually go in and delete data points from areas that uh, are, uh, that demonstrate too much motion. Okay. All right, um, so that's my brief overview of uh, CT perfusion technique and how Diffuse 3 and Dawn and Rapid have changed things for us um, in terms of perfusion imaging. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any pending questions out there. So thank you so much, Dr. Chang, great presentation. Um, that really puts uh, the CT perfusion software into perspective. Oh. Oh, wait, I got one. Yeah. We have a question here. What are the expected caveats in patients with heart failure on rapid output? Yeah. So it's the same thing as um, any uh, of the perfusion um, uh, data. And so what you would expect with uh, poor uh, cardiac output um, or uh, cardiac failure um, is that on this, okay, so this, this is a normal, um, you know, arterial inflow, venous outflow uh, curve, right? You have a peak, and then a decline, and then a steady state. What happens with uh, cardiac failure is that what you'll see is that you'll have a slow peak, and then it plateaus. It never goes down. And that means that the data is useless, because you can't generate um, mean transit time data, uh, you know, and, uh, and so the, 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 the formula doesn't work, and you have to ignore it. And so it's always, I, I forgot, yes, you, you do actually have to pay attention to this curve as well. If it doesn't look something like this, you have to, uh, the data is uh, not usable. Okay, great. Um, we have one more question here. Luxury perfusion versus revascularization of infarct. Mm. Well, so that's the thing, right? Um, so the luxury perfusion is, what is that? that that's actually a recruitment of uh, collateral flow, right? And so that's why traditionally, when you looked at the formula for um, how we visually did an, you know, visual inspection, you actually saw an ischemic penumbra that you may have a normal CBV, uh, but your CBF is low. Because the CBF is uh, telling you how fast the, the blood's getting there, right? But the CBV is telling you the absolute num amount of blood that's getting there. And so the luxury perfusion of collateral flow is, is, uh, would be sort of reflected here. And that's the whole point of the collateral flow, whereas your CBF would be expected to decrease. Great. Uh, okay, great. Well, let's um, thank you again so much. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, request Dr. Bot if he would like to share his screen. Dr. Chang, if you want to stop sharing yours, uh, we can bring up our next presenter. And thank you so much. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, my name is uh, Alec Bot. I'm from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. And I'm going to talk about voice loss today. I have no disclosures. The objectives of this talk are to review the anatomy of the pertinent structures of formation and changes seen in vocal cord paralysis. In doing so, what we're gonna do is review the path of the bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerves, and we're gonna develop a systematic approach to the imaging evaluation of a patient with voice loss. So what is loss of voice, right? Loss of voice is defined as dysphonia or abnormal voice quality, right? When patients come to clinicians though, that's not what they're gonna tell you. They're not gonna say, I have dysphonia, right? They're going to say, well, I've been having some hoarseness. Uh, my, my voice sounds breathy or strained. It sounds a little rough. Um, it sounds a little weak. Um, sometimes, you know, singers can even present with like an abnormal pitch of their voice. So again, they're not going to show, um, you know, they're not going to say they have dysphonia. Now, you want to remember that dysphonia does not necessarily mean vocal cord paralysis. Remember that imaging plays a role when most common causes are excluded, such as your laryngitis due to GERD, uh, your viral or bacterial laryngitis, uh, allergic laryngitis, or just vocal cord abuse. 
So first you need to know the anatomy of the voice box, right? And I'm here to tell you that you don't know, need to know all the complex uh, structures of the larynx. Uh, you just need to remember that the larynx is, um, serves three main functions, right? Phonation, respiration, and tracheal protection, right? You need to know exactly where the, the true vocal folds are located. So these are these sort of um, indentations right here. So there are your true vocal folds. That's, that's where your vocal ligaments are. Uh, just superiorly, you see another set of vocal folds, which is the false vocal folds. Uh, they serve as a protective function. And then in between, you see this lateral depression, which is this uh, laryngeal ventricle. And then, of course, you have all the supportive cartilaginous structures. On this axial image, you can tell that you're at the level of the vocal folds because you see the, you see the cricoid cartilage here posteriorly. So what are signs of vocal cord paralysis? It's always important to look at the larynx. Uh, you know, you can pick up vocal cord paralysis even when it's not suspected. The patient might not be complaining of, of symptoms. So here's, here's the same patient. You have several axial uh, CT images as well as a coronal image. Uh, let's go through these one by one. On the left-hand side, you see this CT image, and you can see that there's medialization and thickening of that left area of, area of glottic fold. Uh, that's sign number one. Number two, if you look on the second image, you can see that the left piriform sinus is dilated compared to the right side. On the coronal image here, you can see that the ipsilateral aspect of the laryngeal ventricle is also dilated. And then you take a look at this axial CT image here, and you can see that there's posterior medial rotation, that left vocal fold here, even that so-called uh, sale sign that we talk about or we read about in, in literature. So four signs of vocal fold paralysis that you need to look for. So here's a test, you know, think about what's going on here. Um, which side do you think is paralyzed, right? You analyze these three uh, sets of images, same patient, you can see on this left-hand image, the CT scan, you can see that the uh, right vocal fold is, um, is adduct adducted. Uh, it's all, you know, it's, it's right at the midline, but look, it's, it's all the way entirely at the midline, right? It doesn't sort of give that sale sign type of appearance. On this axial, uh, CT in the middle image, you can see that the left piriform sinus is slightly more dilated than the right. You can see that the air epiglottic fold is slightly more thickened and a little bit more medialized. And on this coronal image, you can see that the left aspect of the laryngeal ventricle is dilated. So you say to yourself, well, you know, I have right vocal cord medialization, uh, but all the other images point to left vocal cord paralysis. Well, it's actually the left vocal cord that's paralyzed. Uh, you need to be um, uh, cognizant of, of how the images are obtained. These images were actually obtained with breath hold. So the right vocal cord is actually doing its job. It is actually perfectly medialized. You can see if the anterior border and the posterior border of that vocal fold matches up. So look at the entire constellation of findings before you call um, uh, one side paralyzed versus, versus the other. So now that you know how to identify the side of paralysis, you're gonna to wanna to follow the path of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the fibers of which travel with the vagus nerve. So here's the course of the right vagus nerve and the left vagus nerve. And my search pattern is very, very simple. Uh, you know, I follow these um, five, five different areas. You know, you see that the vagus nerve exits the brainstem, it's gonna exit out the jugular frame in it, it's gonna descend within the, the carotid space, it's gonna extend in the mediastinum, and then that recur recurrent laryngeal nerve is gonna um, ascend superiorly to the level of the, the larynx. So let's first start out at the brainstem, right? So your cranial nerve 10 or your vagus nerve contains fibers that I mentioned of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, it exits at the posterior lateral sulcus in the medulla. So here's your axial um, high resolution T2 weighted image. You can see that the, um, typically what ends up happening is, is the ninth and 10th nerve complex um, exit together. Uh, and it's hard to discern one over the other. Uh, but remember that the cranial nerve 10 has, is a combination of four nuclei that are a little bit cranial, a little bit caudal to this level. So if you have a lesion, within the brainstem, it doesn't necessarily have to be at this location to cause vocal cord paralysis or, or dysphonia. I put this image here on the right um, to, to, um, to let you guys know that, um, uh, you know, all the cranial nerves are bundled in, in together. Um, uh, you can see that cranial nerve nine, cranial nerve 10, and cranial nerve 12 are, are together. So, you know, if you have vocal cord paralysis or you have um, injury to the vagus nerve, you can also see that there are um, multiple nerves that are involved, so you can have multiple cranial neuropathies. Here are four patients with vocal cord paralysis with lesions uh, involving the brainstem. Here you have an axial T2 weighted image, which demonstrates this heterogeneous mass within the brainstem. You can see that it has a peripheral area of low T2 signal, and internal high T2 signal. On this axial um, T2 weighted image, you can see that there's hypertrophy of the left inferior olive and um, high T2 signal here. So this is a case of a cavernoma with hypertrophic olivary degeneration. 
Here you have diffusion weighted imaging. The second patient, you can see that this patient has multiple areas of restricted diffusion. There's also an area of restricted diffusion within the left aspect of the medulla. On this axial MRA, you can see um, that the patient actually has a left vertebral artery bisection. Uh, so this patient has multiple uh, infarcts within the, um, the cerebellar hemispheres and the medulla, secondary dissection also causing vocal cord um, uh, paralysis. Here you can see on this third patient that there's post-surgical changes within the right cerebellar hemisphere. You can see that there's nodular enhancing masses, one in particular within the uh, left aspect of the brainstem. On this um, sagittal um, image, post-contrast image, you can see there's multiple um, enhancing lesions uh, within, the, within the thoracic cord. Um, and, and this is a patient with hemangioblastoma and von Hippel-Lindau um, syndrome. Um, and this last patient, uh, there's a history of um, uh, uh, demyelination with multiple sclerosis. So you can see an axial um, T2-weighted image, which demonstrates hyperintensity within the left posterior medulla. And you can see um, increased T2 flare signal within the periventricular and um, subcortical white matter. So uh, multiple sclerosis can also call cause uh, vocal cord paralysis. Next, we're going to move on to the jugular foramen. The jugular foramen, so remember that the vagus nerve exits via the pars vascularis together with cranial nerve 11. It involves the superior ganglion and the inferior ganglion. The inferior ganglion is what you want to remember, um, which is just below the level of the foramen and the exit point of the pharyngeal branches and the superior laryngeal nerve. So the pharyngeal branches send motor fibers to the pharyngeal plexus, supplying the, the, the palate and the uvula. And I need you to remember this because this can help you localize the lesion. So here's the vagus, um, here's the jugular frame right here, a little bit of anatomy. You see the pars nervosa anterior medially, and you see the pars vascularis laterally, that's separated by the, the jugular spine. Here are three patients with lesions at the level of the jugular foramen. Um, uh, these are three lesions that everybody should, should know, okay? Um, here you have an axial T2-weighted image, which demonstrates this heterogeneous lesion, which in, with internal foci of low T2 signal. You see this axial CT image, which demonstrates this permutative moth-eaten appearance of the left jugular foramen, and this is a case of a pure ganglioma. Here you have an axial T2-weighted image in the second patient. You can see this dumbbell-shaped appearance of, of the um, left jugular foramen, and you can see that the, the lesion is sort of intermediate to low signal. But look at, look at the CT image. You can see that there's smooth widening of the bone and the cortex is preserved. So this is a case of schwannoma. Uh, so smooth widening, think about schwannoma. This third patient has this lesion that's uh, low um, in signal on T2-weighted images. But on CT, look at, look at the bone. You know, you can see that there's hyperostosis of the bone as opposed to the smooth widening or the permeative moth-eaten appearance. And this is a case of a, a meningioma. And here on the MRI, you can see that the, the, um, the cortex is also thickened as, 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 as well. So how do I find the lesion? So here's a 67-year-old male with weak voice. Um, here on this axial CT image, um, you can see that there is a right vocal cord um, paralysis, right? There's posterior medial rotation of that right vocal cord. So you know that uh, cranial nerve 10 is, is involved. Um, and then you start looking for some ancillary findings, right? You tell yourself, well, where can this lesion be? So then you start looking and you say, well, the fat, there's fat, loss of fat along the um, right aspect of the neck. You can see that there's loss of um, muscle bulk within the right sternocleidomastoid muscle and the right trapezius muscle. So now you know that your cranial nerve 11 is also involved. So now you have cranial nerve 10 and you have cranial nerve 11. So you think to yourself, well, where are these two um, nerves exit together and are in combo? So you head right up to the skull base and you find your lesion. So you have this hyperattenuating mass, um, which has destroyed the bone at the level of the right skull base. On MRI, you can see that it's low in T2 signal. You can see that there is an intense enhancement of the, of the uh, lesion. And this was a case of, of lymphoma involving the skull base, causing vocal cord um, paralysis. Next, we're going to descend into the carotid space. Now, this image can be very complex, and I tend to forget where all the structures are located um, a lot of times as well, but I need you to remember one key thing. Remember that the uh, vagus nerve descends within the carotid space right at the mid-aspect between the carotid artery and the jugular vein, so posterior medial location of the vagus nerve. Here are three patients, uh, all with vocal cord paralysis, all with different lesions. Let's work through these, these patients. Here you have an axial T2-weighted image, which demonstrates this high uh, T2 signal lesions, very smooth in appearance within the posterior left carotid space. The sagittal, I love the parasagittal images because you can see what the, what the lesion is doing. You can see sort of this oblong sausage-shaped type 
lymphocyte mass that's crawling along the, the location of the vagus nerve here. And we already saw this lesion um, higher up, but this is another lesion of um, the case of a schwannoma. Here you have an axial T2 weighted image here. You can see this heterogeneous mass, again, within the posterior aspect of the right carotid space, right at the level of the vagus nerve. Um, you can see that they're internal foci of low T2 signal. And look at the carotid vessels. They're displaced anteriorly. So this is a case of a paraganglioma or a globus vagali. This last patient here has this infiltrated mass within the left oral pharynx. You can see that there is matted um, necrotic lymph nodes within the left carotid space. In fact, I don't even see the left carotid artery here. And the parasagittal image again, you can see that you have these matted um, uh, lymph nodes um, along the left aspect of the, of, the, of the neck. And this was a patient that had squamous cell carcinoma uh, with left-sided uh, vocal cord paralysis. Let's look at a patient that had carotid space uh, trauma. So you have a 45-year-old female with stabbing injury. Um, here on this axial um, CT image with contrast, you can see that the patient was stabbed right here. You can see the skin neck. You can see multiple foci of air um, that's, that's within the left deep neck. Uh, you look closely on this coronal image, and you look and you say, well, the right common carotid artery looks OK. You take a look at the left common carotid artery, and you notice a little blip. You zoom in, and you see, you know what? There's definitely injury to that left common carotid artery here. Uh, you look more inferiorly, and of course, this patient has left vocal cord paralysis. So there was injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve fibers, uh, and this is actually a um, pseudoaneurysm of the left carotid artery as well. Let's look at another patient with carotid space injury. Um, here you have a 70-year-old male with voice changes. In this axial CT image, you can see that there's posterior medial rotation that left vocal fold. Um, then you start scrolling back and forth. And if you take a look at this carotid right here, you can see that it's very ratty and irregular in appearance. On this axial CT, you can see that there's you know, scar within the left neck right here. You can see these multiple surgical clips. You do a little bit of digging in history, and you realize that the patient had left carotid endoronorectomy. So yes, yeah, so this is an i iatrogenic injury and a patient status post left carotid endarterectomy. Um, and it's one of the risks that the, the, the surgeon uh, tells the patient about uh, prior to, um, uh, to, to reopening the, the, the carotid vessel. So how do I find a lesion? So here you have a 62-year-old male with voice changes and tongue weakness. There's a remote history of squamous cell carcinoma, so I don't need to tell you the diagnosis. Um, you already know where that is. Now it's up to you to find the lesion. The patient also has a history of left and right dissection. So take a look at this image on the left. Um, you can see that the the left vocal cord is paralyzed, right? You see posterior medial rotation of that left vocal fold. So you've, you've lateralized the vocal cord paralysis. You're going to look on the left side. Then you go to this T2 weighted image here, right? It's T2 because the CSF is bright here. You see that there's um, T2 hyperintensity within the left tongue. Now you can see that the, the hyperintensity really stops at the midline. Uh, you know that this is not tumor because no, no self-respecting tumor is going to stop right, right at the midline. Um, you realize that, you know what, it's right at the midline, it's T2 hyperintensity. This is actually uh, denervation changes involving the, the, um, the left tongue, uh, particularly the, um, the hypoglossal nerve. So you have vocal cord paralysis, so that means cranial nerve 10 is involved. You have tongue paralysis, that means cranial nerve 12 is involved as well. Now there's one other uh, hint that I provided for you on the second image right here. If you take a look closely, you can see that the uvula is a little bit deviated towards the right. So that's going to be cranial nerve 10. Remember that I told you that that inferior um, ganglion right at the level of the um, uh, jugular foramen um, sends uh, pharyngeal branches um, and motor fibers to the pharynx and, and the uvula. So now, well, you know that that, that inferior ganglion is right at the skull base. You're going to head right to the skull base, and here you have it. You see this enhancing lesion right at the left skull base. It's infiltrating the jugular foramen. The hypoglossal canal is wiped out right here. Look at this nice canal on the right side. Next, we're going to move on to the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is a little bit tricky because the recurrent laryngeal nerves have a little bit of a different course, um, right versus left. Um, now, normally, um, you know, once you have a normal anatomic arch, the right recurrent laryngeal nerve wraps around the subclavian artery here and, and heads cranially to the level of the larynx. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve heads underneath the aortic arch through the aeropulmonary window and cranially. The left has a longer course, and therefore, it's more susceptible to pathology. Let's look at this on the axial image, right? So I told you that the right recurrent, recurrent laryngeal nerve exits anterior the subclavian artery and over. So here's your right recurrent, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, headed cranially uh, within the tracheoesophageal groove. The left um, is going to exit at the level of the aortic arch. So here's your left vagus nerve traveling more inferiorly uh, to the visceral organs, but you can see that it sort of um, went the left recurrent laryngeal nerve went under the aortic arch and now it's headed cr uh, cranially within the tracheoesophageal groove headed towards the, the larynx. 
So here are three different patients uh, with lesions involving the mediastinum causing vocal cord paralysis. Uh, you can see that there's this um, uh, lymph node in the left periodic region, again, right at the level of the, um, uh, at the vagus nerve on the left-hand side. You can see that the lesion is hypermetabolic and PET, and this patient had metastatic breast cancer uh, with periodic uh, lymphadenopathy. Here we have a coronal um, image. You can see that the patient has left vocal cord paralysis. There's a little bit of dilatation of that um, left piriform sinus. You've lateralized the side. And of course, um, on this coronal image here, you can see that there's this mass lesion infiltrating the med, uh, left mid lung, which extends into the aeropulmonary window. And of course, the course of that recurrent laryngeal nerve is going to wrap right around here. So this was a case of lung cancer in a patient with smoking history. Here on this axial CT, on this third patient, you can see that there's a little bit of posterior medial rotation of that left vocal fold here. Um, in the upper mediastinum, you can see this necrotic um, uh, lesion right at the periodic lesion um, region. And this was a case of lung cancer, um, another lung cancer, uh, also in a patient with smoking history. Here's another patient with left vocal cord paralysis, right? So you've lateralized it to the left side. You can see that there's posterior medial rotation of that left vocal fold. You scroll down a little bit far inferiorly, you can see that the patient has mediastinal surgery. There's also this um, uh, left main um, pulmonary, left uh, pulmonary artery uh, aneurysm. On this coronal image, you can see that this um, this, this pulmonary artery here is going to um, basically um, squish the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve that's traveling through this aortic pulmonary window here. Here's the aorta. Now, um, aortic aneurysms can do this as well. Look at this massive um, aortic arch aneurysm here. Um, here's the, the um, aneurysm on this coronal image. Uh, you can see that uh, that recurrent laryngeal nerve is going have, to have to travel all the way around this aortic um, this enlarged mass of aortic aneurysm causing stretching of the nerve, um, also causing um, vocal cord paralysis. So a few words about thyroid disease and dysphonia. Um, any type of thyroid disease can cause uh, dysphonia. It may not cause vocal cord paralysis, but it can cause um, a change in voice quality. So hypothyroidism can cause mixed edema. Um, including involvement of the vocal cords. Uh, hyperthyroidism can present with vocal cord, variable cord changes. Uh, you can present with hoarse, raspy voice, a vocal tremor. Uh, Multinodular goiter or carcinoma can actually stretch the recurrent laryngeal nerves. And then thyroid carcinoma can actually spread right into the laryngeal structures and um, infiltrate uh, the nerves as well. So let's take a look at three patients with thyroid disease now. Here on this left, you see this patient with this massively enlarged thyroid. You can see multiple nodules. You see calcification here. You can see that the left lobe of the thyroid is markedly enlarged compared to the, um, to the right side. But of course, this is going to cause stretching of that nerves and it caused vocal cord paralysis. In the second patient, you can see this infiltrative mass lesion within the left thyroid. You can see that there's invasion of the trachea here. Um, and, and this is a case where uh, the, the thyroid, um, this lesion uh, permeated the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And this is a case of carcinoma with infiltration of the nerves. Now this next case, um, you see this axial CT image here, uh, and you really don't see any of the thyroid, right? You take a look at this axial image and you see the coronal, you don't see any um, thyroid, but this patient also had vocal cord paralysis. Um, and this is a case of thyroidectomy. So this was iatrogenic, another iatrogenic injury um, causing voice loss. So we looked at several, several mediastinal causes. I just want to sort of compartmentalize these uh, just so that everybody is aware of these um, and you can have them on one slide. Uh, we looked at vascular and cardiac causes. We looked at the aortic aneurysm and the pulmonary artery enlargement. Uh, there are inflammatory causes such as, you know, fibrosing mediastinus that can cause vocal cord paralysis. Uh, infectious causes such as abscess, fungal disease, and viral infection can can do it as well. Um, and then we looked at variable immunoplastic causes. So uh, we looked at thyroid, we looked at um, uh, lymphoma, and we also looked at um, metastatic disease too. Next, we're gonna move into the larynx. So the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve enters posterior to the cricothyroid joints and they innervate the intrinsic laryngeal muscles. So, you know, now we're gonna talk about what causes one of the signs of vocal cord paralysis, right? So your posterior cricoretinoid muscle here um, is the main vocal cord um, abductor paralysis. Um, will cause subluxation of that retinoid cartilage um, anterior medially. And that's what causes this, this um, medialization of that, um, of that posterior uh, true uh, vocal fold. And here you can see that the uh, left recurrent laryngeal nerve is innervated. You can see um, um, denervation atrophy of that left posterior cricoretinoid muscle compared to the right side. Here are four patients with um, 
with dysphonia. Um, remember that I told you earlier that you know you don't have to have injury to the recurrent orange nerve to have dysphonia. There are other causes. Um, here you see this infiltrative mass lesion within the um, right glottis. Um, here you can see it a little bit better on the coronal image right here. And this is a case of squamous cell carcinoma. Um, on the second image here, you see this fluid-filled benign appearing structure within the right periclotic space here. And this is a case of a laryngocele. Um, here in this coronal and sagittal image, you can see that there's this polypoid uh, lesion hanging off of the left vocal cord inferiorly, um, causing dysphonia. And this was a vocal cord polyp. Uh, on this axial uh, CT image here, you can see that there's diffuse edema involving the larynx. And this patient actually had to be intubated due to airway uh, compromise. And this was a case of Renke's edema with a history of, of smoking. So how do I find the lesion? Let's go back to the, um, the, the, the basis for this lecture, right? So I showed you lesions at the brainstem, the jugular foramen, the carotid space, the mediastinum, and the larynx. And what do I do? I think to myself, well, does the patient have dysphonia and higher order symptoms? You know, if there's palatal myoclonus or they have um, anything that, that localizes the, the um, uh, higher order um, brainstem, then you want to look at the brainstem very carefully. Now, you might need uh, MRI uh, to, to evaluate this area, so don't be shy to, to get one um, looking carefully at that posterior fossa. Next, if they have multiple cranial neuropathies, you want to look at the jugular foramen, right? So cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12 uh, center your efforts on that jugular foramen in terms of finding that lesion. If you have several cranial, neuropathy, cranial neuropathies, remember as you go more inferiorly, more of these nerves are given off. Um, and you want to look at the, the carotid space. Um, if the patient has a history of smoking or thyroid disease or metastatic disease, um, I'd like to focus my efforts on the mediastinum, uh, interrogating both the right and the left side as well as the neck phase. And if you see an absence of the bug, the abnormality may be inherent to the larynx. Um, several examples which I already showed you. So in conclusion, uh, what you're going to do in a patient that has dysphonia, you're going to look for signs of vocal cord paralysis. When you find the, the cord that's uh, paralyzed, you've lateralized the side right or left, and then you're going to look along the course of the, the right um, vagus nerve or the left vagus nerve, uh, depending on the side that you find. And you must look along the entire course of that uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, right? So there's five key anatomic areas to interrogate, the brainstem, the jugular foramen, the carotid space, the mediastinum, and the larynx. And you want to remember that you may not have imaging coordinates for symptoms. You may not have vocal cord paralysis. And don't be shy to write in your reports and your impression, no CT imaging findings suggest a cause for, for dysphonia. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I've got my email here. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Um, don't hesitate. Um, and with that, I hope everyone stays help, healthy um, during this, this, this time. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Bott. Really great systematic review on, on, on voice loss there. Okay, it looks like we're, we're set. Thank you so much again, both of you. We really appreciate your time and uh, be well, and we'll see uh, the attendees next time on Tuesday. Take care.